Nesting Birds of the Willamette Valley is presented by Dick Lamster and features photos and facts about cavity nesting birds um, of our area, including nests, habits, behavior, and more. Mr. Lamster keeps 41 birdhouses on his property located south of Eugene, and he will discuss birdhouse building and management. Dick, Dick is an avid birder with over 40 years of birding experience, and he just returned from a birding trip to Cuba, where he saw 159 bird species, including most of the 28 endemics to Cuba. He, he's a retired natural resource manager for the Army Corps of Engineers and a past president of both Lane County Audubon Society as well as the Mount Pisgah Arboretum. He's a life, he has a lifetime bird list of over 2,500 species. And with that, let's welcome Mr. Lamster to our Science Pub. Thanks, Maggie. I was going to say that if uh, you didn't like that uh, program, I did it. If you did like, no, she did it. If you did like it, I did it. <laughs> the questions. I've known Coast Fork Willamette, uh, or Coast Fork uh, Watershed Council since its beginning, and you guys do a lot of really good stuff. So congratulations on that. Good job. I read your newsletter all the time. Yes, a lot of work. It's a lot of work. So I have questions for you. Raise your hand if you're a bird watcher. Oh, that's almost everybody. How about you? If you feed birds, if you don't have any money left, no, that's not a question. <laughs> How many have bird houses? Oh, quite a few. Okay, good. All right, you'll like this. So I have to credit my wife, Mavis Souls, for helping me put this thing together. Uh, tonight is also the Lane County Audubon Society's monthly program. We have Noah Stricker speaking up in Eugene tonight. You probably know Noah. Many of you do, yeah. So he's a Crestwell boy. He's done good. Greg Gilson took a lot of these photos. I took some also. Can I use your table? Okay. <laughs> Grace Fowler is here tonight. Raise your hand, Grace. She, she's a great local birder. She's also in charge of the Cottage Girl Christmas bird count. So if you do not go on that bird count, you should. So talk to Grace. I like questions anytime. So anytime you have a question, go ahead and raise your hand, and I will try to answer it. Sometimes they wait till the last 15 minutes, but I'm going to ask. Anytime you have a question, raise your hand. Okay, my, qu my talk will also answer most of the uh, quiz questions. So, just not yet. <laughs> so, wait, one of the questions was how many cavity nesting birds in Oregon? The answer was 52. There's about 30 to 35 in the Willamette Valley, but only about half of those will come to human-made houses, just so you're thinking along those lines. So let's go to the next slide. Now, this is not what I'm talking about when I say cavity nesters. <laughs> I just want to be clear on that. <laughs> and of course, the woodpeckers, you saw that slide earlier, they are the uh, the, the the masters of cavity nesting birds. Um, they make holes that most many other cavity nesters nest in. Think of uh, swallows or cavity nesters. They can't drill a hole in a tree. <laughs> Bluebirds can't do that. So woodpeckers not only live in cavities themselves, but they make the holes for others. However, there are other types of cavities that you may not be thinking about. There's burrows. And the birds up there nest in burrows, which is a cavity if you think about it. I'll talk about the other two later, okay. A belted kingfisher is a cavity nester. Next slide. It builds a cavity, it excavates these themselves in a river bank. They go in uh, five to 10 feet and um, there's a little, um, little uh, place in the, at the end of the hole where they lay their eggs. The hole is, the, the whole thing is tilted slightly outward, uh, lower, so that if the water does come up in the creek, it doesn't come all the way into their little house or little cavity. So it's a pretty smart way to build a, a burrow, and so your eggs don't get, uh, don't drown. 
So uh, most people don't know kingfishers are cavity nesters. Uh, other cavity nesters that make burrows are the uh, bank swallows. They live in banks. Got that? Okay. Bank swallows, banks, sharp group, and <laughs> rough wing swallows. Other burrows, yes. Burrowing owls. How many have seen a burrowing owl? They're a pretty cool little critter. They're mostly in eastern Oregon, but they do nest in Willamette Valley. Other. Western meadowlark. Now that seems a little unusual, but they make they nest on the ground and they make kind of an open nest, but they cover it so that and they make an entrance in the side. So even though they're ground nesters, they make their own nest, they cover it with grass to enter from the side. That is a cavity nester. I'm getting a lot of feedback. Is that is that okay? Can you hear that okay? Okay. All right. Louder, louder, louder. All right, I'll keep trying. Can you turn it up or? They'll turn it up. Okay, um, what's the state bird of Oregon? <laughs> Who said cowbird? <laughs> Well, I've heard somebody else tonight tell me that. I have not heard of that. The school children of Oregon made it the Western Metal Arc in the 1930s. Who's going to outvote school children, really? Oh. <laughs> well, there's a second person to tell me. I'm going to have to look that up. It's possible I made a mistake, but probably not. <laughs> Next. <laughs> That's the Metal Arc nest right there. Not a very good one, but it does show the hole in the side of the nest. That's a cavity. Okay. Also, um, crevices and vertical shafts uh, are actually cavities, covered ledges, swifts, turkey vultures, dippers. There's also, uh, I'll show you, pendulous sacks of weaved uh, grasses and stuff. Those are actually cavities. Okay, next. So voxes, swifts, it's not voes, it's voxes. How many have seen the swifts go down the chimney at Agate Hall and the University of Oregon campus? That is quite a sight. It's happening right now. It happens twice a year. I'm not bothering your dinner, am I? Okay, if you don't eat it all, let me know. They, they do that in the spring when they're coming from Mexico, South America, going north all the way to British Columbia. And in the fall, they're going back the other way. Uh, that Agate Hall chimney is a huge chimney. It can hold 10,000 or more swifts at any one time. I've seen 12,000 go in that chimney at one night. That's a big chimney. Now, the Village Green over here used to have a chimney that allowed swifts. Does it still have that? You're, right, you're shaking your head. They didn't cover that? No, people are saying no. This was back in the 80s or 90s. I think they covered it probably. But there's, there's a part... Ah, so there's a lot of chimneys around that do have swifts in them. A lot of old houses with old uh, uh, brick chimneys. You may have swifts uh, roost in there during their migration. You may have swifts nest in there during the nesting season. Now, swifts uh, travel um, during migration in huge numbers, it's like a river flowing through uh, from Mexico again to British Columbia. Um, it takes about a month for them all to come through. But when, so they roost in these chimneys, you know, one to 10 to 1,000. But they only nest as, as two birds, one nest per chimney. <laughs> they don't nest together, but they do roost together. It's kind of interesting. Okay. American Dipper. Everybody knows about dippers probably? Dippers, fun little bird, fun little bird. Uh, they actually... Um, do nest in crevices in banks where you see them along uh, creeks, the freshwater creeks. So they're considered a, um, a cavity nester. Bush tits, a uh, pretty little bird, kind of nondescript. They make a really cool nest, which is a pendulous sack, and it's also a cavity. They go in it from the side, that's a cavity. 
Okay, let's go back to woodpeckers. All woodpeckers are cavity nesters in Oregon. There's 12, as you found out. How many of you heard of or gone to the, the Woodpecker Festival in Sisters on the other side of the mountains? That is a real fun festival to go through. I've been there a couple times. One day we saw 11 woodpeckers in one day, 11 species in one day. So if you have nothing else to do in June, <laughs> go over to Sisters and go to their festival. You can really, uh, it's, a lot, it's fun to see that many woodpeckers in one day. I had a friend of mine who's a world traveler, been, has written several books on, on birds. He says that may be the only place in the world where you can see that many species of woodpeckers in one day. It's a little bit of a trick question because there's not that many woodpeckers in the world. <laughs> so that helps some, not many species. But we have them here because we have a lot of tr trees. Yes, sir. Is there Pardon me? No, um, as soon as the snow gets off and they start looking for cavities. Yeah, I think that festival is in June, though, so that would help direct you. Good question. Yeah. Like I said, 13 species. <laughs> <laughs> Who made up that test? <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Seven in the Willamette Valley, of which uh, this is a, a couple, the downy woodpecker, the smallest woodpecker in Oregon. Uh, go back, yeah. Can you go back one? Okay, the red-breasted. We get reports that this is, is the red-headed woodpecker that is actually in eastern... North America, but this is actually a red-breasted sapsucker, and it, its breast is its breast is red, not its chest. Its breast that gets people cons confused. So it's a red-breasted sapsucker, which is a woodpecker. Okay. Pileated woodpecker is the largest woodpecker in Oregon. It's a big it's a big one. It's also the largest woodpecker in North America. All right. <laughs> Lewis's woodpecker is not very common. It's more along river banks, um, but you, they are in the valley here, and they're also in eastern Oregon. How many have seen a Lewis's woodpecker? Yeah, yeah, they're pretty, pretty subtle, but very cool, yeah. Okay. All right, the only falcon or hawk is the American kestrel. You see them on the power lines, telephone lines, all up and down the valley all the time. They are a cavity nester. Owls, they're big cavity nesters, 15 in Oregon, 10 are cavity nesters, six in the Willamette Valley. This is one of them, the Barnes Owl, okay. Northern Pygmy Owl, little guy. He's, next one, Screech Owl. Their song is that bouncing ball sound. Very good, who did that? Good job. <laughs> Pretty soon there's going to be owls flying through the door. <laughs> Do it again. That's perfect. I'd watch out for these owls that are going to be coming through here. <laughs> it's called a bouncing ball. You can hear it at dawn or I mean at dusk or maybe during the night too. Very good. Spotted owls are cavity nesters. Okay. Okay, wrens. Six in Oregon, five are cavity nesters, three in the Willamette Valley. Marsh, Buick's wren is one. Marsh wren is another one. Yes, yes. This woman is paying attention. <laughs> they build a nest, uh, it's not on the ground, it's in the reeds, and they go through the side. That's right. Good job. Okay, let's get into, um, who wrote this? Oregon has one heck of a lot of ducks. <laughs> Not only the University of Oregon ducks. <laughs> <I know. laughs> My wife told me that would happen. <laughs> and as usual, she was right. <laughs> Tw 28 species of ducks in Oregon. What did you say? Oh, never mind. So wood ducks are cavity nesters. Most people know that. And these little, they nest pretty high up, depending on where they can find a cavity. But when the babies are ready to leave the nest, they just kind of jump out, a little ball of fuzz, fall maybe 20 feet, hit the ground, bounce a couple times, <laughs> and take off. They never go back. 
So, uh, but they're all fuzz, so I don't think too many of them, uh, I think they all survived the, the, f the nest jump. Some of the things that you probably didn't know about, but a common golden eye are cavity nesters. Okay. Barl's golden eye, they're more up in the, the foothills and into the, the um, forest a little bit, but I consider that part of the valley. Buffalo heads are beautiful little guys. They're also cavity nesters. That's a male and a female. Hooded merganser is one of my favorite birds as far as color goes. They are just gorgeous. They are, it's, it's, they're hard to find. They're, 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 they're out there, but they're hard to find. There's some of them below the dam at uh, Dor Dorina, I know. Okay. Maggie has a question. Um, do they nest in si similar cavities? The short answer is yes. It has to be a big enough hole for them to get into and a big enough cavity for them to lay there. Sure, you can leave it here if you want to. Uh, <laughs> has to be a big enough cavity for them to lay their eggs. Some of them lay you know, 15, 18 eggs. They don't all hatch, but yeah. So it's a, but basically similar. The ducks are, those, those ducks are almost all the same size. They're not huge. A mallard's bigger than all these. So um, good question. No, it's in a tree, in a cavity, in a tree. Yeah, sorry, good, good question. No, these, these, uh, they don't, they can't, um, they can't excavate their own cavity, so they have to take either a woodpecker's hole, or more than likely a, a dead tree that's starting to fall apart, or maybe a branch fell off, and where that branch fell off, usually the, the wood dies. So, but the whole reason for my talk probably is to tell people how critical. Uh, habitat is for cavity nesting species. It's uh, it's tough for those little guys. Yes. Pardon me. Good idea. The question was, what was the question? <laughs> Whether they nest in mud banks, because I sort of gave that impressions, uh, but they do not nest in mud banks. They nest in cavities and big trees. Thank you. Maggie told me to do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, she told me. <laughs> okay, swallows. There's seven swallows in Oregon. Six are cavity nesters. They're all in the Willamette Valley. That is a very young tree swallow and a very young bird watcher. That's my great niece, and she loves birds. A couple things about this photo is uh, see the, the beak of that very young tree swallow? It's, it's white or light yellow. If you're in a cavity, a very dark cavity, and you want your mom or dad to feed you something, you don't want to have a black mouth. <laughs> you want to have a good target. So that outline in white will show up in the nest, and that's where they'll drop their food, insects. So a pretty good thing. Now, robins, as you probably all know, are open nesters, build their own mud nest. The inside of a robin's mouth is red. So you're out in the sunshine, you want your mom to feed you, how about a nice red target? <laughs> Makes sense. Okay, where are we? We're cliff swallows. These are the ones that made the mud gourd type nest. You've seen them. Purple martins are the biggest swallow we have. There's not a lot of them in Oregon. If you grew up in the Midwest, these are the swallows that come to those big um, condominium birdhouses that people have in the Midwest. Um, they can maybe have you know, 15 birdhouses all together and uh, they eat a lot of insects. That's why people love to have them in their yards in the Midwest. Minnesota, Iowa, etc. There are some in Oregon, though. Okay. Question. If you build a Martin house, will you get more Martins? <laughs> Next question. No. <laughs> All right. Gr Grace is going to answer that question. What's your answer? No.
So I'm going to answer your question. No. <laughs> Yeah. Part, and you've answered it well, Grace. Part of it is there's not a lot of Purple Martins in Oregon to begin with. And so to get them come to your house is going to be very, very difficult. You're better up putting up swallow boxes and just put up, you know, swallow box, 50 yards later, swallow box. You will get swallows, and they do eat a lot of insects. But don't be, don't, I would not encourage you to do a lot of work on, if you put up a Purple Martin house, colony of houses or a condo, you'll get one swallow maybe, <laughs> or one pair, because they don't nest together closely like that. Good answer. Okay, where are we? Oh. Am I moving along? <laughs> Chickadees, three in Oregon. They're all cavity nesters, but only two of them are in the Willamette Valley. Which one is not in the Willamette Valley? Somebody said mountain. Mountain is the correct answer, yeah. Mountain chickadees are on the other side. So that is a black cap chickadee. Okay. What's the question? <laughs> okay. Chickadees nest in old woodpecker cavities, or that's one species that a lot of people build their birdhouses for. Is so a, a, you know, a birdhouse that'll hold a uh, bluebird will also hold uh, chickadees, and you can build a smaller house for chickadees because they're a smaller bird with a smaller opening. And I have a lot of handouts up here you can have free of charge, and uh, one of them is uh, the cavity, I'm sorry, the dimensions of a good birdhouse, and it kind of depends on what you're trying to attract. I don't know if Purple Martin is even on there. Purple Martin is not even on there. <laughs> they just don't, they're just not that many. So good question. Did I repeat the question? Yeah. Two in Oregon. The other one is a chestnut back chickadee. If you have one, you're more than likely to have them both. Beautiful little guys. Nuthatches. Red breasted. You're, you're, you're anticipating. <laughs> nuthatches. Red breasted nuthatch. Uh, there's three nuthatches in Oregon. All are cavity nesters. Two in the Willamette Valley. Which one is not in the Willamette Valley? Nuthatch, that's a cavity nester. <laughs> that's cheating. <laughs> the pygmy nuthatch. Pygmy nuthatch is an Eastern Oregon bird. Yeah. You even didn't get that one. <laughs> That'll work. <laughs> Do we have the white breast? Okay, there's a white breast one coming to a birdhouse. Okay, next. Okay, reasons for decline of cavity nesting birds. Kind of a long slide. You can read through it. Um, some of it's very logical. Number three caught me by surprise during my research. Back when first uh, farmers got here, or even on the East Coast, they used tree limbs and tree trunks for their fence posts. And then they started getting four by fours for their fence posts. But those would rot out and that cavity nesters birds would use those fence posts. Well, we started replacing them with the metal T post. <laughs> and so a whole lot of artificial habitat for birds also went away. <laughs> Besides their natural habitat, the artificial habitat went away. So that was the reason for a decline for a while. Of course, house sparrows and starlings didn't help. Uh, domestic cats around town are hard on cavity nesters. All right, next one. Why should we care? Why should we attract cavity nesters? They eat insects by the thousands every single day. They eat weed seeds. They're beautiful. They're fun to observe. Connects us directly to nature, not by television. One of my favorites. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there you go. Natural eagle. All right, here we go. Is that us? Is that us or what? Is that us? <laughs> Better than television. Okay. If you want to attract cavity nesters and other birds and critters to your yard, here's some things you can do. I know the Watershed Council also has things like this to tell you about. 
Wait a minute. Yep. Okay, the last one up there is have a messy yard and garden. You now have my permission to have a messy yard and garden. And if your neighbor doesn't like it, so what? <laughs> Who cares? If you care about your neighbor at this stage in your life, forget it. <laughs> but some people say, well, I have to. My neighbors will just run me out of the neighborhood. So have a, maybe a nice front yard. Not a lot of grass, but some trees and shrubs, a little bit of grass. But then have a really messy, great habitat backyard. You'll love it, and it's less work. <laughs> so most of you say that you do feed birds. This is very true. <laughs> You'll never outsmart the squirrels. I know some of you probably have come up with something, but basically they're still pretty darn smart. I saw a video once of a, of a guy, uh, this is in England, a guy had a, a bird feeder and he wanted to keep the squirrels out. So he strung it on a piece of wire, put the bird feeder right in the middle, and of course the squirrels immediately went right to it. So then he put a piece of conduit, a little bigger than the wire, in f about five foot sections all along there. And then so if, it, if the squirrels hit that conduit, they'd spin around. <laughs> Within 36 hours, they could walk along there without spinning. <laughs> <laughs> They're pretty good. <laughs> They're pretty good. <laughs> yeah, that's the truth. What's next? Okay, now this, I, uh, I have the, the birdhouse, I've been doing birdhouses for over 30 years, uh, 23 at my current location. My target has been bluebirds. Now those, many of you raised your hand that you have birdhouses. Um, you gotta have the right habitat to get bluebirds. I don't have the right habitat. I have 10 acres, about four acres of open field. They want the open field, but they probably want more than four acres. So I do have one or two pair, maybe three pair a year. I have one pair this year. So that's our target. What we mostly get is swallows. Tree swallows and violet green swallows. Get chickadees, uh, house wrens every now and then. So um, swallows are fine, but bluebirds are really, really nice. Okay. So this tells you of all the, the species that I get in my houses, this is how many I've fledged in the last 23 years. And you can tell it's mostly violet green swallows and tree swallows. Very few bluebirds. Bluebirds is the white one on the far left. That's a lot, I'm not done. All right, people have trouble identifying tree swallows from violet green swallows. So I'm gonna show you something tonight and you'll never have trouble again as long as you live. I need a, we don't have one. So. Look at the beak of the bird and just follow the white where it meets the dark all the way across the head, down the back to the feet. That's a tree swallow. There's no dark, there's no white above that white line. I think of tree swallow, the letter T, and I think of their, from the beak to the feet as a T, there's no white above the T line. Okay, let's go to the next one. There you go, white above the, what I call the T-line, also on the tail. You can't see the tail very well, mostly the rump. Can I say rump in public? Okay, I will. I, I, I could say worse. <laughs> Let's go, can we go back to the other one? So, no white above the eye, tree swallows. Next one, white above the eye. Now you'll never forget that, will you? Never, all right. <laughs> Do you work here? <laughs> <laughs> now these are the guys that'll really mess you up, especially if you live in town. Live out in the country, you may not have them, but uh, English sparrows or house sparrows. I mean, they, they kind of look like the devil, don't they? They have that beady little eyes and that hooked little beak. And 
the starling. Both introduced species have only been in North America for 100 years or so, 120, 30 years, but, but they've done really well. We should admire them for their ability to take over, but it's an unlevel playing field. They nest earlier, they're more aggressive than our native birds, and um, they're, they're, they're hard on the ecosystem. <laughs> yep. Okay. Okay, she wants me to elaborate that they're hard on the ecosystem. So we'll do that afterwards over a beer. No. <laughs> <laughs> they take the nesting habitat of uh, native birds. They eat the food of native birds. So they eat food and there's not, not much else, there's less for the native birds. Uh, they're very aggressive. So um, they're d they, they take over the habitat for nesting and food, basically. Okay. So if you're going to build a successful house, of which many of you have, these are what you need. And I have this uh, in handouts down here for free of charge. Um, probably the one thing that bothers me the most is people put perches on their house. And if you think of a cavity nester in the wild, there's just a, a tree with a hole in it. There's no perch there. Cavity nesters in general are equipped with very strong uh, claws that they can grab a hold and cling to the hole, and the most many of them, especially woodpeckers, have a tail adaptation where it digs in. So the perch actually gets in their way. So uh, no birdhouses with a perch on them. Unnecessary, and it could get in the way, and it may help predators sit on that and look inside and try to get something. So no perch. Um, and the next one, easy opening door. I really encourage people to, to clean them. You got to clean them in the fall, and you got to clean them one more time in the spring. Uh, if you don't clean them, then uh, insects and other critters are attached or attracted to the poop. Can I say poop here? It's too late. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the uh, earwigs, uh, mites. Um, Many, many things are attracted there, and they will not necessarily kill the little birds the next year, but they certainly irritate them, and they weaken them. So you want to clean that stuff out. Good. Yes, question. Yeah. yeah. So she said she worked in a rehab, and they got many, many, many cavity nesting babies every year with uh, insects underneath their skin. Fly larvae. fly larvae, okay. I know, so people say, well, in the wild, nobody cleans out their cavities. That is true, but they only use a natural cavity maybe once or twice. Then they go to another one. Our houses, we want them to use it for years and years and years and years. That's why we're gonna clean them out. So open them up, scrape them out with a putty knife, and then maybe clean them with a 10% bleach solution to get into the cracks and leave the house open for a couple days and they're ready to go. <laughs> Thanks for that, yeah. Yes? The question was, is it too late to clean them now? You're on the edge. So if you got somebody starting to build a nest, don't do it. But if some of your houses are vacant, do it tonight. All right, tomorrow morning, tomorrow morning, okay. Sun up, sun up. <laughs> yes, sir. Talk more about hole size and critical. Hole size is critical. Um, again, in nature, they take what they can get, but we're trying to adapt or we're trying to attract the birds that, that we want. So, and I have a chart over here that talks about hole size. The, the probably the two big things are inch and a half will attract bluebirds, chickadees, um, all the swallows. Uh, even a hairy woodpecker, then for the bigger birds, a little bigger hole, and subsequently a little bigger um, cav or, uh, inside also. So um, you can look at this. Good, good question though. Hole size is, is critical and the distance from the hole to the bottom of the house. It has to be quite a ways. I have a house here that um, really isn't very good. <laughs> 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 Has a perch. 
The distance from the bottom of the hole to the bottom of the house is about two and a half inches. A bird nest is sometimes four or five inches, so a bird couldn't use this. It was probably a 4-H project, a Girl Scout project. It's very nice. If you have one, it's okay. Tur <laughs> this man over here is quite lazy. <laughs> Instead of building another house, he wants to turn it over. <laughs> Not enough space. You got to put five eggs, five babies in there. Can't do it. But nobody's ever said that before. <laughs> I, I, I learn something every day. <laughs> yes, Grace. What she's talking about, I'll have to lay this down for a minute. Go ahead and talk. She's talking about the, the door. Scrape this up so the bird can climb out afterwards. If you, uh, if it's smooth or like a board or something, the little baby bir oh. little baby birds can't climb up that. So that's what you're talking about. So this is the house that I use. Um, I put it on an eight. It's not really this. Okay. <laughs> I buy an eight-foot post put it in the ground two feet, so the house is right here. I don't want to carry around an eight-foot post with me. <laughs> and um, some of the features are, of course, no perch, the right hole size, uh, easy opening. I usually have a nail right here, but I dropped it someplace. Anybody have a nail with them? <laughs> <laughs> ventilation holes. This can be like a little oven in July. So you need ventilation holes. Some people put a slot along here to let the hot air out. I have holes here also to let the cool air in. Um, drain holes in case water does get in there. So uh, again, I have all of this on, on a handout there, but uh, this birdhouse building isn't as simple as it looks. A lot of old guys retire like me and him. <laughs> I don't even know him. <laughs> and they say, well, I gotta do something. I can build a birdhouse. Anybody can build a birdhouse. And they make them fancy. They seal everything up. They paint them beautifully. The paint is for you, not the bird. <laughs> the bird really does not care. <laughs> but they can be beautiful. You can make them beautiful and functional both. <laughs> but there's a lot of features to it. Yes, ma'am. I, I can't hear you. Yeah, usually about six, six inches, six and a half inches. Five inches probably works. But what you don't want is a predator sticking their head in there and getting the babies. Now, I put mine on a post like this. So predators can't climb it. I, I, can, I got it. Predators, house cats, snakes. Before I started doing this, I had mine on four by four post. Everybody did. I had a bull snake or a go gopher snake, as we call them here, climb up that four by four post into the house, ate five of my tree swallow eggs. Now, snakes have to live also, but they don't have to eat my bird eggs. <laughs> it was at my office, and I was gone. I got home, and the office staff was very upset because they saw this happen. So I opened up the lid, and the, and the snake was still in there with five lumps in his belly, <laughs> saying, thanks for the dinner. <laughs> So after that, I started putting them on post. Question over here. Of what? S squirrels. You know, in the, 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 in, in the wild, squirrels are one of the biggest predators of bird nests. Not necessarily cavity nesters, but open nests. Squirrels eat bird eggs like they're jelly beans. So in the wild, squirrels are a big, but they haven't bothered my houses that I know about. Yeah. Jays can't get in here. There's no, no place for them to perch. Raccoons can't climb this. Possums can't climb this. So this really reduces the predation. Those are good questions, though. How am I doing for time? 640. Huh? 640. 640. So 7 minus 640, 20 minutes. We're doing good. <laughs> Yes, I just got nail hinges here. 
Well, it's it's held together with a with a nail right here. It's held together with a nail. He asked, "Can they push it in?" But I have a nail here, but I've lost my nail. It's it's a sad story, really. <laughs> so and then you just pull the nail out with your hand. Yeah, <laughs> gotta have fingernails though, or a good screwdriver. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I forgot where we are. Okay, Wh where are we? Oh yeah, so here's my my mounting post. And not how many? Those of you that have, oh Joe. Ah, you're you're he's a smart guy. You ought to hold on to him. So I have many of mine are in the in the field in, in the sun. Sometimes I have two nestings. And some of you with houses have two or three clutches a year. Some do, yeah. So. Those can get like little ovens, like I mentioned earlier. I devised a second roof. So I put it about an inch or inch and a half above that roof so that the wind can blow between the new top roof and the roof of my house. So it sort of acts like a radiator. So if you have a second clutch and you find a bunch of dead birds, it could be dehydration killed them, try this radiator roof. <laughs> So it's, I, I don't put it on until I know I have birds in there because it's kind of clumsy. Where but it <laughs> well, I didn't bring one with me. <laughs> All right. So I built a second roof the same size as this. I put I put little uh, risers right there, about an inch, an inch and a half, and put that second roof on. So there's airspace between this roof and the second roof. Good question. Most people don't care. <laughs> I care and you care. And the birds care. <laughs> Those of you that had birdhouses, it just breaks your heart when you open a box and there's five dead babies in there. It just breaks your heart. So we're going to do everything we can to try to keep those little guys alive. Good question. Thanks. Nope. So I, uh, you'll see soon. My wife and I check our houses once a week during nesting. We work together. She has a mirror. She opens the box, looks in the mirror to see. see she's short. <laughs> to see what's in there, five eggs, five babies, et cetera, and closes it. It's about uh, 10 seconds a week, and it does not bother the birds. I'm sitting there with a pencil and a clipboard writing down what she sees, and you'll see the results of some of that. So. Your mothers probably all told you never touch a bird's egg, that they will never come back to the nest. Great advice, totally wrong. <laughs> Baby, mother, parent birds are great parents. They will literally give up their lives for their babies if they have to. So they will go back to the nest even if you touch it, even if you touch an egg. You biologists out there know that. A lot of uh, times they check nests and they'll move an egg or something. So. You know, don't juggle them, <laughs> but you can look at them. Good, good question. What about predator guards? Oh, predator guards, sharp. I, I expected to give my talk and get out of here. <laughs> so, so <laughs> I'm never going home. So you can put another a fake hole on a piece of wood, probably uh, uh, maybe an inch or two inches, and put that fake hole over this one so that it makes a tunnel. You can, can you visualize that? I didn't bring one of those either. So you can visualize, so it's another hole on a separate piece of wood, so suddenly you have a tunnel into the hole instead of just this flat one. And that'll keep out uh, other, especially squirrel or um, raccoons that try to stick their hand in there or their arm. That'll make a much, much longer for them, re a much longer reach. Good question. I don't use that because of my posts. I don't have that problem. But if you're on a 4x4, four four, you may have it. Good question. My goodness. You're going to have to pay me more money. <laughs> you can double it, right? So, um, uh, you know, a lot of people put their birdhouses on a tree. You'll get chickadees there. It works. People have been doing it for 100 years, but it also opens it up to predators. Location is probably somewhat overrated. Birds will take what they can get. <laughs> um, five to six feet off the ground, like I mentioned. Uh, the distance between boxes is, uh, 
is debatable. I've read half a dozen books. I have uh, 50 handouts, and they're all a little different. <laughs> so, I mean, you've got to have them far apart, but how far is somewhat relative to your yard, your terrain. Um, you know, 100 feet is probably pretty good. 100 yards is three times that. Yes, ma'am. So her question was, I'm repeating it, <laughs> how about having bushes below the birdhouse so if a baby falls out, they'll land on the bush and not on the hard ground. Overkill, but if you want to do it, go ahead. Basically, they don't fall out much. Uh, you've probably seen it a little bit. Uh, they, when they're ready to fledge, they go. They get on the edge, they take off, they catch air, and they're gone, and they never come back to the house. They come back to the yard continue to eat insects. So, I mean, that'd be nice, but, but not, not necessary. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't thought of that even, but yeah. Another question. Let's see now. Where am I? What one? Yep. Close. Okay. So. Where does not near Not near. Do I have that up there? Yeah. Yeah. How far? Um, I'd say at least 50, 50 feet to 100. See, most cavity nesters in the winter time, in the summertime, are insect eaters. They're not seed eaters. There's a few exceptions, so they won't come to your feeder anyway, and they may bother the birds that do. So it, it's, it's just it's one of those fine points. Not a big deal, but if you're having trouble keep come, having them come to your birdhouse, move your birdhouse away. The birds at the feeder won't bother them. Good question, though. What was your question again? Okay, again, insects, which are the main food supply of most cavity nesters that we're going to attract, eat insects. So you've got to find a place that has insects. That's why a lot of them uh, uh, build their houses along rivers. Lots and lots and lots and lots of insects. So um, that is this you can't really reproduce r insects very easily. <laughs> Good question. The water is a big thing. Are you still here? Oh. Question. Oh, 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 question. Yeah. Great, great question. How often does the same bird return to the same house? And the answer is a lot. Now, songbirds don't live very long. Five to nine years, probably. A nine-year-old songbird's an old songbird. So five to seven years. But they do, they almost always, well, they come back frequently. And I can tell, you have to band them to really figure it out. But um, you know when the same, you know, tree swallows show up at the same house first time in April, you say, you know, they knew that house was there. <laughs> and <laughs> what do you say? Need lease forms. <laughs> right. <laughs> that works. Good question, though. Okay, where are we? Okay, so this is where I do the, I don't expect you to do this, but if you want to keep track and if you're curious, uh, do a weekly check of it. And um, if you don't want to do it weekly, do it monthly. There is a few practical things besides gathering the scientific data. If there's a dead bird in there, it's a good idea to get it out of there because it will attract the mites, the flies, the earwigs, blowflies, something else. If you leave it in there, you know, not, it, it, you know it may or may, it's going to be harmful one way or the other. Birds may survive, they may not. So there's a benefit to opening up besides just a scientific observation. Wasps. Somebody asked me before I started talking about wasps. Those of you with birdhouses, how many of you have had wasps in them? Yeah, so there's little, pa I call them paper wasps. I'm not sure what they are. They'll b start building nests in there because it's a nice, safe place for them. As soon as we check our houses in, the, in April, we, uh, if we see wasps, we just squish them and take them out. Wasps have some beneficial value. The few we're going to kill aren't going to hurt anything. So take the wasps out. I'm not sure the wasps and the birds bother each other a lot, but it's logical they probably do. But I haven't, I've, I've had houses that have fledged five babies, and there's a wasp nest up there. So I haven't read anything about it really, but I think they're probably more harmful than good to a little baby birds. So I'd say take them out. If you don't get them all, that's okay. Um, you have a question. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, so Maggie here picked up this, I say, remove house sparrow nest. House sparrows and starlings are non-native. Subsequently, you can send them to their demise anytime you want, any legal way. All other birds are protected by law. Now, hunters can hunt waterfowl because they get a license for it. But as far as uh, disturbing uh, nests, eggs, and adults of songbirds, you can't do it. It's against the law. So house sparrows, if you find a house sparrow nest in your birdhouse, you can take it out any way you want to. Now, we all love birds. We don't really want to kill birds. Maybe eggs. It takes about 20 of them to make an omelet. So anyway, that's why I have it up there. You can remove house sparrows legally and English spur and um, s s uh, starlings legally. Is that what you meant? Is that what you wanted me to say? <laughs> I'll say anything you want. <laughs> if a chick falls off, pick it up, place it back in the box. Good advice for anything. A baby robin on the ground, find the nest, put it back. Those parents can raise it better than you and I can. Probably better than rehabilitators can. So if you can find the nest, get it back up there. Same as the chick that falls out of a well, cavity. The paradigm or the uh, myth is that they won't come back. <laughs> That's, that is an old wives' tale. How about a myth? That's an old myth. <laughs> it's an old husband's tale. It's a damn lie. How's that? Can I say damn here too? <laughs> okay. Can I say damn? Okay. Poop, damn. <laughs> I got the mic. I, I'm in a pub. There's been worse things said here, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, those are good. You guys are, that's good. All right. So that's my wife on the right checking the birdhouse. Um, you, see a, well, you can see the nail there on the right side kind of sticking out. So she, she has a mirror in her hand, and we're counting them really fast. Okay. So there's one of my monitoring sheets. Only if you're a scientist, you'll be the only one that appreciates this. <laughs> but we'll email. So in 2011, this house number one was empty. 2012, I had a double nesting. I had chestnut back chickadees fledged five, two unhatched eggs. The second nesting was a chestnut back chickadee fledged eight birds. My record is nine. A, a chestnut, a black cap chickadee laid nine eggs, hatched nine eggs, fletched nine babies. That's a lot of work. That's a lot of work. Yeah. So six or seven is more common. Next year it was empty. The next year, Chris, uh, chestnut back chickadees fledged five. All right, next one. Okay, I have 42 of these. You got time? <laughs> This is the last one. 2002, five tree swallows fledged, one unhatched egg. 2003, fledged three, two dead babies, one unhatched egg. 2004, tree swallows fledged five, one dead baby. Fairly, fairly typical, fairly typical. Next one. So I put out this little birdhouse report. I'm gonna read it word for word. I just, I send it to about, a, about 10 or 20 friends and, and they, they think I'm nuts, but I still enjoy doing it. <laughs> Num uh, on your comments, number four, the number of nests affected by house wrens. House wrens don't play well with others. House wrens will fill up houses full of sticks, never plan the nest there. They'll take other birds, babies out, throw them on the ground. They'll peck holes in eggs. They'll take eggs out of the nest. House wrens are really not, they don't play well with others. Did I say house sparrow? I meant house wrens. House, they're native, you can't, you can't hurt them, but they just don't play well with others. Okay, and this year I had 50% of my houses had wasps in them to start with, and I cleaned them out of most of them, and sometimes they do a second time, but not a big deal. Okay. Cleaning out birdhouses, we've talked about that. Uh, let's see, mites, fleas, lice, ants, wasps, gnats, earwigs, blowflies, and more. Okay. I know that birdhouse has a perch on it, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> okay. Uh, page three, uh, one thing that we do, so tree swallows and violet green swallows, not bluebirds, line their nest with feathers. 
So you have a fun time finding feathers in those houses. Where do they get some of these feathers? Well, feathers are a little shortage in my place, so I get feathers from a, from a chicken farmer, and my wife and I throw them in the air. We have a little updraft to our, on our, how we live on a hillside, and the swallows come around and take those right out of the air and take them to their house. We've been doing this for over 20 years. We get people to come out and look at it, and they just, they're amazing. They're amazing. It's fun. I was rafting the Rogue River about a dozen years ago, and there was a bald eagle up on the tree. And so we kind of slowed down the boat and was watching the bald eagle, and he kind of shook, and uh, he does it better than I do. <laughs> Two tail feathers, or small feathers, flew out, or came out of the bird and started drifting down. Swallows came and got those just like that. It was cool. I mean, it was really cool. <laughs> so they're... I know, well, that's true. They don't. You cannot possess legally possess a bald eagle feather. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> well, good thing I didn't have my ticket book there. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, one day I found a feather in there that was really strange. It had a, a spine with little spines coming out, hardly anything what we'd call a feather. And I didn't know what it was. I finally asked my friend that runs the Wild Birds Unlimited. It was an emu feather. I found out that a person up the hill a ways had emus that I couldn't see from the road. So that was kind of weird. Oh, also, when bird flu became a big thing like 10, 15 years ago, we used to get our feathers from the place in Springfield that you can buy stuffing for pillows and stuff like that. They quit selling feathers uh, because of the bird flu thing or something. So they started getting artificial feathers. And they look just like feathers. I mean, they do. So we said, OK, my wife said, let's get those. Birds would not take them. They knew those were not real <laughs> feathers. <laughs> Um, and they look, if I showed one to you, you'd say, that's a feather. Man. <laughs> if your houses aren't being used, move them every two or three years. Just move them to a different place. Um, 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 um. Okay, next. Ah, where's that? Number fourth one down. Oh, trap starlings. A little distasteful. Had a good friend in um, Silverton named um, Tony Cook, and he had hundreds and hundreds of birdhouses because he tried to run an organic cherry orchard. And those tree swallows, violet green swallows, bluebirds, would eat insects, and he didn't have to spray for insects. But he had starlings, so he trapped them. And when he, he, he had a uh, kind of a guillotine, it didn't cut off their head, but he, they went inside, a little weight, closed the door so the starling couldn't get out. And then he sent them to starling heaven. Well, <laughs> I don't know if there is a starling heaven, but they went someplace. So again, a little, har little uh, hard to stomach maybe, but they're aliens, you can do it legally, and they were driving out the native birds. Ah! Yeah. <laughs> At least they don't have perches. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> yeah, okay. There's that house wren, which is a you know, wonderful little bird. Great song. They really sing, but uh, they don't play well with others. Okay. Mortality, these are what breaks your heart. Too cold, too hot. If the female dies when brooding, brooding, most time the males just can't take it over. Not that the males aren't important. We are. But <laughs> females do a lot better job. And if one adult dies, especially if you have eight little babies in there, one, one, or the other adult's going to have a hard time feeding them. Okay. Yes, eggs, house wrens, starlings, house sparrows, jays, snakes, cats, raccoons, possums, squirrels. If you have the right size hole, wherever that guy went, that will eliminate many of those. And if you use the post, the metal post, instead of the wood post, you'll eliminate more. We're going to maximize our effort here. OK. Feeding time. When, once the babies start to sit in a hole, they're just a few days from fledging. Yep. Oh. Who has that? <laughs> I'm a, I, <laughs> Did you have one? Somebody had a, oh, oh, I thought it was a, <laughs> I was looking for my laser pointer this afternoon. I couldn't find the damn thing. <laughs> there it is. It showed up. All right. 
So lots of mortality, even when you're trying to control the environment. In the wild, the few studies I read, about two-thirds of baby bird eggs laid never fledge. So that's only about one-third fledge. So by having our artificial houses, we're increasing the odds. Sometimes not real good, but my worst year, a little over 50% died, either didn't hatch, dead chicks. But you can see some years, only 20%. So I'm beating the odds of natural uh, houses by quite a bit, natural cavities. OK. This is what keeps us going. Even though we have mortality, we have da 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 da. This is 24 years of uh, cavity nesting birds on our house. The big thing is we fledged 2,181 babies. Yes. <laughs> About 72% fledged. So that's, we feel good. Next. Again, the perch. Another perch, I know. <laughs> okay. So you're in, you're in this little house with your four or five siblings for 21 days. You kind of feel close. So when you get out, some of them still hang out together really close. I thought that was a cute picture. Yeah, uh, they're still kind of hanging out close, waiting for little brother. They pretty much all fledged this in one day. That's not true of all species, but it is of the ones that we have. All right. This was uh, six weeks ago. <laughs> so, remember, if you're a cavity nesting bird, you have to think inside the box. I'm out. Yeah, oh. perfect.